It's Monday, and you know what that means. Jersey First TV proudly brings to you the latest edition of Real Talk, and certainly I am New Jersey's premier award-winning journalist, top Latino for three consecutive years as voted on by the Latino Spirit Online Magazine, along with the United States Latino Affairs Initiative. And without a doubt, ladies and gentlemen, I'll continue to be the weapon of mass disruption here in Garden State Media because my level of honesty, now more than ever, is truly necessary in this era of journalistic deception. And of course, I am everyone's favorite conservative. It's me, Fernando Uribe. Happy Monday, ladies and gentlemen. Happy tax day. Hopefully you get to file your taxes on time. Don't forget to claim President Zelensky from Ukraine as one of your dependents because, you know, we are paying for him, of course, with our tax dollars. So if you're having difficulties in claiming dependents, always remember you can rely on President Zelensky from the Ukraine to claim on your tax form. But all kidding around aside, folks, I do want to thank you all for joining us here on the 15th of April. Of course, thank you all for tuning in from wherever and however you may be doing so here on Facebook Live via StreamYard, of course, on the Jersey First YouTube page, and also on all of our social media platforms. Folks, I cannot say enough how grateful I am to that you always like Real Talk with Fernandi Rebe and Jersey First on Facebook. Of course, you check out our content all the time. I can tell by the metrics. Don't forget to follow us, of course, on Instagram and, well, I, I'll keep calling it Twitter, but follow us on X. Of course, for all your YouTube subscribers, I know you're watching YouTube for something every day, whether it's sports, pro wrestling, podcasts. Hey, click the subscribe button right there on the Jersey First page, and you'll be notified of all of our great content available every single week. And, of course, whether you get your po podcast on Spotify or SoundCloud, download Jersey First and take all of our great shows with you anywhere at any time. Hey, the weather's getting warmer. Maybe you're going down the river, going for a quick run. Maybe you're walking your dog. Maybe you're going grocery shopping, doing errands. Whatever it is you're doing, folks, I'm pretty sure you have your smartphone or your tablet with you. Of course, since you do, check out Jersey First anywhere at any time. And I cannot say enough, ladies and gentlemen, how proud I am to be on the dream team of Garden State Media. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It is always Jersey First TV. Brand new episodes of the Nader Narrative premiere every Thursday online by going to jerseyfirst.org slash TV, and of course, on all the aforementioned social media platforms. And it's hosted by the amazing Elizabeth Nader. If you want to check her out. And of course, every Thursday, you'll also see brand new episodes of Bridging the Gap hosted by AJ Melillo and Stephen Rombolo. And of course, every Monday night, folks, check your local listings, of course, for times. But you'll see brand new episodes live and in living color of Real Talk with Fernandia Rebe via Jersey First TV. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to stick around for final thoughts because I'm going to have a lot to say about Tom Moran and the Star Ledger. And quite frankly, folks, if, you know, just when I think that Tom Moran cannot do us any bigger of a disservice with the just atrocious level of journalism, if you, if you keep it, call it that, at the Star Ledger, Tom Moran, little Tommy, always finds a way to rise to the occasion and remind us all why he's probably one of the more terrible journalists in New Jersey media. Well, folks, you definitely want to stick around for that. You'll have a few laughs. Get the popcorn ready. Um, you'll definitely enjoy Final Thoughts. And also, ladies and gentlemen, you also want to stay tuned. I'll be giving you some more updates about my upcoming fundraiser coming up on Friday night, April the 26th at the world-famous Lolita's Mexican Cantina located along River Road at 8809 River Road in North Bergen from 7 p.m. until 2 a.m., folks. I'll be partnering with Alzheimer's New Jersey to once again raise awareness about Alzheimer's and dementia diseases that are ravaging our communities now more than ever. Again, folks, 7 p.m. to 2 a.m., a $20 suggested donation is welcome at the door. Of course, I'll be joined by my incredible co-host, Vladimir Carrero, Yanoli Guerrero, Jacqueline Rodriguez, and Miss Emily Amato. Folks, we're going to be partying all night. It will be raffles at 50-50. Incredible music by DJ Ziggy Roman. Just an amazing amount of networking opportunities. And again, folks, all proceeds benefit Alzheimer's New Jersey. I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the show. But folks, it's an election season. And you know what? When it is, I like to talk to candidates. I like to talk to legislators. I like to talk to journalists. Of course, I also like to talk to those that run political action committees. Of course, folks, PACs are, uh, have been rising in numbers now more than ever. And here's an interesting PAC you definitely want to check out. Of course, check them out on Facebook. It is Somos New Jersey PAC, folks. Make sure you like them on Facebook. Of course, follow them on Instagram. And joining me live here tonight from the wonderful, freedom-loving state of Florida. Not that we know anything about freedom-loving here in, in New Jersey, but there in Florida, listen, 
It's good to be him, folks. He is the he is the distinguished chairman of Somos New Jersey Pack, folks. He is Mr. Joe Barreto. Join us here on Real Talk. Joe, how are you? Good. How are you, friend? I like the introduction. Thank you so much. How are you? I appreciate. It. Hey, listen, I'm great. Uh, even better to have you on here, Joe. And folks, again, check out Somos New Jersey Pack on Facebook. Once again, also follow them on tw- uh, excuse me on Instagram. And get make sure you get all the information there about this wonderful nonprofit organization and political action committee as well. Joe, uh, first of all, I'm very jealous. I love the sunshine there, the palm trees. Uh, I got to tell you, man, it's good. it's good to be you right now in, in the great freedom loving state of Florida. It really is. It's good here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate wow, that. Absolutely. No, the pleasure is mine. Uh, Joe, let's get right to it here. Now, one of the things that stood out for me reading the Somos New Jersey page, and this is where, again, the academic in me gets a little, you know, sospechoso, and I start thinking, mm, I don't know, let me let me dig into this a little bit. Uh, but Somos New Jersey aims to connect the Latino community, uh, communities with individuals running for political office. Now, Joe, the first question on my mind is, what type of individuals would you say Somos New Jersey is trying to empower and encourage to run? I mean, I'll give a specific example that concerns me. But when I think about that, I think, well, I'm a conservative. And when I think about how prevalent conservatism is within the Hispanic and Latino community, believe me, if it's up to me, I want as many conservative Latinos running for political office, whether it be for federal offices, state or municipal. But that's not always the case. So let's sort of separate fact from fiction here. What does Somos New Jersey ultimately aim to do? So we do aim to empower Latinos. We're a nonpartisan PAC. Um and as I mentioned to you off camera before, so three of, we have a good mix of board members. So I have three members that are progressive. Alexandra Costa and I are more on the conservative side with Democrats, but we're more moderate. And we're just trying to empower people. Here's the thing, especially where we live in Jersey and where I grew up in New York, yeah. Latinos aren't always told how to get to that level, how yeah. to get the, 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 how to be able to even run for a position, school board, whether it's school board, um, council, or even a position on a board on, for a company. So we're trying to empower our people to make sure that they know that they are on equal footing and we've struggled to get there. And that's what we're trying to push. We're trying to make sure, it, I don't care if you're Republican, I don't care if you're Democrat, if you're independent, you do the right job, you do right by the people and you stick to your word. That's what's most important for us. Well, certainly, listen, I, I think that it bears repeating that we want representation. I mean, certainly the census data will tell us that probably within the next 10 years, if not sooner, you know, the United States, much like New Jersey, isn't getting whiter, isn't getting blacker, it's getting browner. It's getting browner with people like you and I um, in our community because Hispanics and Latinos, again, have been migrating here. Uh, A little more on immigration later. I really want to get your thoughts on that. But we're opening up businesses. We are entering the workforce. We are entering colleges and universities at a rapid rate. I mean, Hispanics and Latinos are earning degrees, not just undergraduate degrees, but graduate degrees at a not even a commensurate rate to their white and black counterparts. I mean, Hispanics and Latinos collectively are becoming that plurality, I would say, not just here in New Jersey, but nationally. And it sort of begs the question that, again, we come from all over, the Caribbean, Central, South America. And again, not to be get overly political here, but it's a pack. And when I think about sort of the belief system or the values that have become prevalent within the Hispanic Latino community, uh, Joe, I got to tell you, there's, there's some conflict there, right? Because we're seeing that there are progressives, right? there are some moderates, there are some conservatives like myself, and we're kind of all over the place. Again, uh, to your point, we're, we're entering corporate America. We're also running for school boards, now more than ever, I think being on a school board is incredibly influential and important because of the curriculum that our kids are exposed to. And I think that, you know, now more than ever, Hispanic and Latino parents alike are seeing, hey, we want to raise some concerns about what our kids are being exposed to in school. We also want to make sure there's representation in the corporate world, but more so, we want to make sure there's representation at the federal, state, and municipal level. And I think that, again, you know, the sky's the limit for our community. And that's why we, we, Alexander and I decided to do this together um, two years ago. The issue I have, and this is going to be personal, uh, my own opinion, not even on behalf of Somos per se, but I'm tired of being told how I should feel, think, and do things 
by people that aren't Latino, from people that aren't of my background or my culture or my, you know, it, it, it gets exhausting when you always constantly have to fight to get to that level where you get the respect and where people see you almost an equal. Joe, let me ask you this. It sounds, I think you'll take the high road here, but I don't have to on my program, but it sounds like, because I say it all the time, when you, when I hear you say about other people telling us how to feel or whatever, it, the first thing that comes to mind, it's like, it's like annoying white liberals that tell us how to identify as a community, like the Latinx. And again, I'm, full disclosure, that's nonsense for me, <laughs> but it's always offensive when I hear other demographics trying to tell us, como nosotros podemos, Right. But I don't just put them in a box. But here's the thing. I'm not just going to say is the, you know, liberal or this or that. You sure. can have your own kind that are Republicans and Democrats sure. and whatever say the same thing. Sure. I'll give you the perfect example. I ran 10 years ago for city council in Hackensack and I had people tell me because I'm Puerto Rican that I wasn't Hispano because I'm American. You got to be kidding me. I love rice and beans just the same. Give me a chuleta. I'm down. But, you know, this is so this is why one of the reasons it gets under my skin that we constantly have to. People put us in a box, right? If they think you're automatically, you know, Puerto Rican or black or whatever, you're you got to be a Democrat, right? No, yeah. my father wasn't. My father was the ultimate Republican, super conservative, same, right? Same, same and, here. And, and, you know, as I told you earlier, I was super liberal growing up. I lived in New York. I work with, with a lot of people in, in government. But as you get older, you change and your views change and the way you, you see things, you don't want to give it all away, right? So... Here's the thing, for our pack, we want to make sure we empower people from wherever they're, they, whatever they're, everybody's background is different. You could be Colombian like you are, you said in Cuban, but not everybody had the same experience you had. Sure. Yeah. Right? So I don't want to put you in a box, but I'll tell you what, I don't have to agree with you. And here's where I, where I, where I think our pack is different. We don't have to agree 100% on, on what the other person's views are holistically. Right. So just because I say I'm a Democrat, that doesn't mean that I like all the, the fiscal part of it or I don't like the economic part. I, I don't like it. Right. But the social aspect, I want to treat my people, you know, with respect. So when you see someone throwing paper towels at your people when you're on an island, I know people are going to take it differently. That irks me sure. because you're, 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 you're kind of raining on somebody that's already been through hell. So that's why I'm able to to take apart those things. And I want to get to the person. I have more friends that are more Republican and more conservative than I do Democrats. And guess what? When we became friends, I didn't ask them what your affiliation was, because that doesn't matter to me. You're the person. I love you for you. I don't care what flag you want to use behind you. And that's what we try to promote with our PAC is that everybody has a say. Everybody should have a say. I should hear the person who I may not agree with totally, but I, they still have a voice. Yeah. And my problem is that as Latinos, we don't get the same opportunity to have the voice. And that's where we're stepping in. And we need to make sure that we're heard. And we need to make sure we're at every single level right there. Like my father always told me, you're not better than everybody else, but no one is better than you as well. And I well take said, that to the grave. Well said there. Folks, if you're just joining us right now, it's 713 here on the East Coast. Joining me live right now, he is the chairman of Somos New Jersey PAC. You can check him out on Facebook, of course, follow him on Instagram as well. Uh, out there, uh, I'm I'm jealous as hell. There, out in the great freedom loving state of Florida, Joseph Barreto. <laughs> I'm coast. <laughs> joining us here on Jersey First TV. Uh, Joe, you mentioned about representation, and you mentioned about the importance about giving everybody a voice. And you know, I'll, full disclosure here. Again, I like to do my homework on everybody when I invite them to my program. I look through social media. I look at you know whether it's journalists, PACs, legislators, candidates, whoever. And there's something you mentioned before about making sure that everyone's heard. Now, I don't care for her personally or her husband, but, you know, when I saw Patricia Campos Medina being denied access at the time, certainly when, you know, before this whole county line lawsuit was uh, presented by U.S. Representative Andy Kim from the 3rd Congressional District, obviously, there was a lot of hoopla, right? Obviously, you had uh, Representative Kim going up against the queen, I'm sorry, uh, uh, First Lady Tammy Murphy, of course, being enabled by the emperor, I'm sorry, the governor, Phil Murphy, and uh, along with other candidates, right? We had uh, a progressive in Larry Hamm, who seems to be running all every cycle almost, and Patricia Campos Medina. Now, again, I don't care for Patty personally or her views, 
But I have to tell you, when I started being denied access to county conventions, the first thing that came to my mind was like, I was like, okay, Mina, I don't like her, but she deserves to be heard at county conventions and let county committee people vote up and down and see who they want to endorse in that Senate race, which again, now all of a sudden the Senate race in New Jersey has become one of the more watched Senate races in the country. Who would have thought it? But having said that, um, you know, that caught my eye right now when you when you mentioned that, hey, listen, it's about representation. It's about making sure that everyone is heard. I know you did do a segment with her recently. Tell us a little bit more about what that was like and what prompted you to reach out to her. Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, again, being a Latino, and, and here's the thing, I, and I, I think I told you this earlier, um, it's weird for me because I'm not Jersey born and bred, right? So I come from a whole different background and outlook from New York politics and how it was there. And I've met her several occasions. I've seen the work she's done in the community to help people in terms of, you know, helping them get the vote out, helping them, um, you know, when it came to union issues and things like that. And I'm going to be honest with you, being a, a Latina, doing that work and being given some light is not easy. So I respect that. I respect the hell out of that. And especially being a woman now, you know, in, in politics is never easy. But we decided to put her on, you know, to have it, to interview her and put her on our channel. We also asked um, Congressman Kim, but his schedule didn't allow him to do it yet. And we were going to ask First Lady Tammy Murphy, and we didn't even get a chance to ask because she withdrew her, her name. So when I spoke, when we spoke with Patricia and had her on our, our channel, you know, she had some good ideas. Do I agree with all of them? Personally, no, because again, I'm not, that's not what I'm inclined to do at this point in my life. Sure. You would have asked Joe and, you know, when he was 19, 20 years old, sure. I would have been all in. Oh, yeah. But again, I love the fact that she takes the time to, to at least put herself in a position. She's taking a risk. It's not easy. People forget when people run, whether you, it might be easier, and maybe I'm talking out of pocket here, but it might be easier for someone who's the millionaire, who has all the people in place to, to write to this, to that, and, and do the bidding for you, and you're the face. And it's harder for people of like from our background that have to scramble to try to collect 250 bucks to make sure they have enough people to put out there to get signatures for their sure. petitions. You know what I mean? Or to get their message even heard or a flyer. Yeah. That's why that's what we're trying to do. So I don't care what part of Jersey we're statewide, mm -hmm. you know, and we want to make sure that we get we get that equal footing. I'm tired of being offered the scraps. Y la cosa que se en el piso. Yeah. I'm tired. I don't I don't tired of doing that. I'm past that. You know, Joe, I'm with you. I'm with you about that. And again, I think it, it it's it's really it's a testament to what you're saying about so much New Jersey. I think about trying to be as accessible to everyone as possible while getting a message out. Having said that, I know you mentioned earlier the diversity of thought that exists within Somos New Jersey. Having said that though, while you're nonpartisan and you don't make endorsements, are there moments where, again, that diversity of thought could create a conflict? Again, the reason I'm Absolutely. asking, the reason I'm asking, I'm, is, again, I'm a conservative. I can't think of really any progressive policies, if maybe one or two off the top of my hand, that I would say, okay, because by and large, again, I'm a fiscal conservative. I think here in New Jersey, as a property owner, yeah. as someone who works here, as someone who's being suffocated with taxation, it, it kind of drives me crazy when I hear, and, and, this, and this is this is the best one here. I have friends from grad school that left New Jersey and said, mira, New Jersey's just suffocating us. It's way too expensive. And I'm like, well, okay, well, why is that? And of course, you're just giving me a softball down the middle of the plate to swing at. Having said that, They'll move to Georgia or Florida or the Carolinas, and they'll be like, bueno, I moved here, and you know what? I'm going to run for school board. I'm going to run for council because we need to make this blue. Oh, yeah, you just left a state that is blue as Windex. We saw what blue policies are doing to New Jersey. In Florida, I'm like, wait a minute. Make this make sense, folks. And this is, I think, what, again, drives me crazy about people that identify as progressives that, yes, Everything sounds cute on paper, okay? It's like it's like going on Tinder. Yeah, you know, you keep swiping. The girl looks really, really good. You can read the specs. At some point, you got to look at the reality. I think that sometimes, though, Joe, I think that gets lost when it comes to policy. So 
with your executive board, I mean, ultimately, how do you deal with that diversity of, of thought? Because you're going to conflict at some point. So, and that's a great question. And what you will see, and I don't know how other people react to your questionings, but I, we're open books. We can disagree. We can have a discourse. The bottom line that makes it easier for us is a respect. We have Veronica Caldenas, who's an immigration attorney. Natalie Vance is a social worker. A. Balieri is a, works for a private company. They're younger. They're in their 30s. And they have younger kids. And they have, you know, they're so... I go back to my head how I was back then, and I'm able to, to, to break that apart and go, yeah, I get why there's certain things that, that jive with them or their family circumstances, right? So I'm able to separate that. Alex and I, Alexander is able to separate that. So we go with the person, you know, so you kind of have like a checkoff list and you go, okay, we can agree on this, this, and this, and this. This is a disagreement. But whatever the final number is, is what the final number is going to be that we make the, the push and say, okay, this is, you know, so, and we get, we vet people and this is the difference. We'll vet somebody just because you're Latino or Latina and, and you're, you know, Rivera Rodriguez doesn't mean I'm going to be patting you on the back and go, yeah, Papa, you got my vote. Or yeah, we're going to do, it. no, well, you got to go through us because we're not going to just rubber stamp or because you knew somebody who was related to so-and-so and owed them a favor. We're not doing that. Actually, that's how come we were created, because we were tired of seeing the same machine run over and over and over and see people with the same last name for the last 50 years. You know, as soon as you were born, you know, your grandfather was the councilman, you were councilman 40 years later. It's just garbage. So we want to make sure that now we, we are a majority, we will be the majority. And we're hardworking, we're loyal, we're, we're God-fearing. We have everything that it takes and the work ethic. But to be denied because of our last name or where the heck we were born, I'm tired of that. We're tired of that. So we can always come to an agreement, even amongst our board. And that's why we picked a diverse board. I'm not even kidding. It is beautiful to see because it works. It can work. Certainly. You and I both know, I don't know how old you are, I'm 57, but I can tell you, I, I'm a Democrat, but like I told you earlier, I voted for Reagan my first vote out. I voted for Republicans when I knew a Republican would do a better job. I don't care. Criticize me. Let the Democrats try to take away my Democratic card. But it's the reality. I want the best job. I don't want a label. I don't need an elephant or, <laughs> or the donkey. I don't need any of that. I want the person that really has their heart in it for the right reasons. And that's what we stand for. And that's what we're trying to do. Joe, oh yeah, we have you because you don't look a day over 44 as far as I'm concerned. So God bless you, bro. Okay? That's it. So, no, I'm just, being, I'm just being real about it. Folks, it's 723 here on the East Coast. My guest tonight here live is the chairman of the Somos New Jersey PAC, Joseph Barreto. Join us here on Jersey First TV. Uh, Joe, you know, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic here, even though that's part of my brand, but um, this is arguably the most consequential election cycle of my adult life. And for our community that is really being ravaged by inflation still, by higher fuel prices, the cost of food uh, continues to suffocate us, uh, the cost of homes, interest rates, the idea that every metric tells me that policies in the White House and policies enacted by the president's party is harming Americans and more so ours our community, where there are so many, I mean, there's a rise of Hispanic-owned businesses. There's a rise in Hispanics and Latinos going to colleges and universities, attaining multiple undergrad and multiple graduate degrees, going into the workforce. It's, it's a scary time for our community. And never mind, like, there are real life issues here, not pronouns, none of that nonsense. Real life issues that are affecting our community, Joe. When it comes to, again, these economic metrics that, and again, it's sort of alarming because of a country of 450 million people, give or take, you know, the two candidates we have to pick from coming up on November the 8th are two Caucasian men, one in his 80s, one in his late 70s. I'm not trying to be an ageist here. Um, I certainly have a favorite in the, in the race. But again, I think it's also demoralizing for our community where 
you know, we're not seeing issues that our community are being suffocated by, arguably being addressed. Um, again, in your capacity as a PAC, talking to others that run a PAC as well, how frustrating is this election cycle for you? It's super frustrating. I mean, they could have, <laughs> anyone else could have been picked for the love of God, you know? And I just think that little by little, and I don't know if it's the, the maybe the, the generation before me or us that can start to initiate that, but I guess we just get so locked in over all these decades of, of going with, with the alleged tried and true, with going with um, people that, you know, the name recognition, or they've been in Congress this long, so they deserve this shot. Yeah, but you haven't done a damn thing for me in the 40 years you've been there. So what, why should I do it now? And I get what you're saying about the expense. My wife has a business in, in New Jersey, in Hackensack, and, and we get destroyed. It's hard. But what we need to also focus, and I guess that's where I, I kind of come at odds sometimes with, with, and our PAC does, is that we can get both. We can get the social piece of it and people taken care of, and you can get the fi the fiscal part of it and taken care of without having to super label everything and be so divisive. And that's what we try to do. So we try to help those that either have been here forever and never had the opportunities or never were taught correctly how to go about things. And we try to teach them. We go to churches. We'll go to schools. We'll talk about... Um, you know, if you if you're a resident, how you can become the citizen, how you could open up a business, how to open up your first credit card, right? Because they're not they're not told that when we were kids. For me, it was credit was bad, credit was evil. You can't go nowhere without credit right now. So, you know, we try to cover all aspects. It's not just a political piece because we want to set the foundation firm and solid so that we can grow from there as a people, not a divided people, not a, yo no voy a hablar con ella porque es republicana o ese porque es demócrata o ese, you know, I'm tired of that. Because again, when, at the end of the day, if I sit with you for dinner and I'm going to a Spanish restaurant, I'm going to order rice and beans and I'm guessing so are you. Absolutely. Mira, con tostones, un flan, and probably, you know, start to go on all you somewhere. And I'm that's sorry. what I'm, and that's the goal. Is it easy? Absolutely not. It is difficult when we get chastised and criticized because if you run into a certain group that says, oh, but you're to this, and the other one goes, no, but you're to that. You know what? Why can't you just take me for this and that I'm trying? Take me for what I'm trying, at least, because there's a lot of people that sit on their ass and do nothing. And those are the ones that like to dictate. And that's when I said earlier, I'm tired of being told the ones that sit down and do nothing. They're the ones that piss me off because they're the ones that are, people feel like they have to kiss the ring and be holding to. I'm tired of kissing the ring. We're not kissing the ring anymore. We want level ground. We want our opportunity like everybody else because we work hard. We pray hard. And, and our work ethic has, as a, in history, has been phenomenal. Why can't you give me the opportunity? Why? And that's what we're trying to push. Joe, well said there. Uh, let's let's put our thinking caps on for a moment. And again, being Hispanics, Latinos collectively, we know really the issues that are, I think, most prevalent during this election cycle. But let's 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 dig a little bit deeper here. Okay. What? Not the presidential candidates per se, but let's 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 just look at party. When it comes to us, when it comes to our community, when it comes to Hispanics and Latinos and Latinas, um, what are Republicans doing wrong and what are Democrats doing wrong? Honestly, sure. they're sticking, they're letting people in their space on the far right and the far left dictate what you can easily fix going a little bit more towards the middle. And I, and I say that because I've always, growing up, I was always taught that it's never good to have all of one thing, right? So if you have a uh, um, all Democrat slate of, of of officials and this and that, or all Republican, where's where are you where are you dealing with the you know somebody else's point of view or somebody else's uh, perspective, right? So I like that mix. I like to have a place. That's why I like where I live in Hackensack, where it's bipartisan, nonpartisan. You just you can have a mix on the board, and and you get the ideas from different people. So um, so let's say for instance, on this particular front, we're going to build a park. 
I think is too expensive. It's not physic, uh, fiscally correct to do it. The other one goes, yeah, but the kids in that area are underserved. So that conversation comes in. And then we meet in the middle and we get the job done. It may not be the biggest part, but we're giving them a little part. Something that works. And that's the problem. You have, you know, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene on one side and AOC on the other. It drives me insane because I'm just like, for the love of God, that's not, it's a caricature at this point. It shouldn't no, be. Well, no, no, well said. Um, and obviously, you know, when we talk about the issues that are most prevalent during this, during this election cycle, you know, the importance of meeting in the middle. When it comes to immigration, though, Joe, and again, this is a big issue coming up this cycle. Uh, we're going to have both candidates talking about it during the debates in October. We're seeing cable news. And again, let me just sort of unpackage this a little bit to sort of give perspective here in context where, you know, I grew up very much like yourself. You know, I like reading the paper. I'm a typical guy. I'm reading the New York Post. I like to read the sports first and work my way through the editorials to the front. You know, I like physically, tangibly reading the paper. Obviously, we know that print newspapers have been dying out, whether it's by their own doing, their own irresponsible journalism, that's another conversation. But the point is that everything has become very digital. Our community has really, I would argue, relished the usage of the internet and obviously social media. We go back to the mid-90s. I mean, I think back to, you know, the infancy of looking at sending an email, how, like, how mind-blowing that was in the 90s. Oh, I'm sending an email to someone across the country or across the world, and they're getting it, and we're having a conversation. Then we saw the rise of social media applications. Obviously, my, I mean, I'm dating myself here a little bit you know, with MySpace <laughs> in the early 2000s. But then, of course, you know, the the birth of, of, of the Facebook in 2005, which would transition into Facebook. YouTube that same year, we would see Instagram, sorry, we would see Twitter going into 2007, 2008, then Instagram, and then Snapchat, and now TikTok. I would argue now more than ever, our community, I think, has been relying, and maybe to a detriment though, Joe, too much on social media for information, for consumption, to where I think it's, you know, the art of doing your own research, the art of, hey, let me look up all facets of an issue, not just what my smartphone and the algorithm and the newsfeed is telling me. I would argue that our community, I think, has almost fallen prey to that. And, and these companies have been predatory with the way that they disseminate information. I think our community has been, mira, se están comiendo como un, como un pozo de tostones. What's going on? I, I agree with you 100%. And what, what you don't know, I don't think I shared with you, is I have a journalism degree. I, I was a journalist when I was young from St. John's University. I got my nice. degree there. And, you know, I read all those papers. And I'm going to get, I'll share this with you to give you an example of how just crazy it's become and partisan things have been. Last week, I was in a New York, international New York Times article nice. on a watch collection that a reporter, a former student of mine, turned me on to a reporter because he has a watch collection. He's in Harlem. I worked for 34 years in East Harlem. And I came out in, the, in this newspaper, international version of it last week. I was happy because I see a Latino in my eyes that can show people. And I even said into my piece, I'm a Boricua at heart. Not many Boricuas do this as a watch collection or whatever, right? And I had somebody tell me, literally, Ugh, that paper. And I'm like, I don't get it. Like, who cares? I could have been, I wish they would have interviewed me on Fox News and I would have said the same thing I said on this side over here on, you know, uh, either the Daily News, the Post or whatever. It doesn't matter. But people just go to the, the dumbest thing to pick something and, and just muddy it up a little bit. And, and that's why I think a lot of the issues, they're going to hit hard in November. You mentioned immigration before, you know, I have a lot of people that, a lot of friends of mine that are now residents, thank God, and they, for 20 years, they fought, they fought to do things the right way, and their money was taken. Lawyers took their money and left, and left them hanging dry. Those are the people that I want to help. I don't want, now do I want, you go to another country, my cousin lives in Switzerland. It took him 30 years to become a citizen, and he works there. So when people tell me, oh, they're making it difficult here, no, there has to be a better way. Nobody should get hurt coming here or getting thrown out. There has to be a better way to do it. But no one wants to sit their ass down and hash it out because everybody's too good for that. So we just keep kicking the can down the road. And you know what? Eventually that can's going to stop rolling and, and it's going to get ugly. And it's already getting ugly. 
Well, to your point about getting ugly, I mean, obviously it's it's been weaponized. I would say during this election cycle, I mean, we're seeing almost daily posts, whether it's on social media, whether it's a, on 24-hour cable news about the border, how wide open it is, and certainly people. And again, listen, like anything else, cable news is very predatory. They know what to, they know what to cultivate when it comes to, you know, what gets clicks and views and what you know the headline. And we're seeing, obviously, the I would call the, you know, he, here's the receipts from irresponsible border policies. And of course, you know, within our community, that also presents some tribalism, Joe. And the reason I say that is because I would argue more than any other demographic. I mean, we're very tribal. OK, I'll sort of put this in this perspective. OK, I'm both Cuban and Colombian. But let me tell you, if you're from the Caribbean, you're going to have something to say about people in the Caribbean. OK, if you're from Central America, you're going to have something to say about your fellow Central Americans. And you also have something to say about Caribeño. And if you're South American, you have something to say about South Americans. You have something to say about Central Americano. You have something to say about Caribeño. It seems like this vicious sort of cycle, Joe, and the tribalism within our community I think almost reaches a level of toxicity. And again, I'm not trying to be funny here, but no, but you're it, right. there's a level of toxicity that we're I we're our think worst enemies. We're our worst enemy, and people don't get that. And, and that's why, like, I'll give you an example. I worked on 116th Street in El Barrio of Manhattan from Bye. 1988 to Bye. 2021. Wow, best job in the world, right? And Puerto Rican Day Festival was on 116th, right in front of my school, like right down the street. That's right. And my kids would tell me, Mister, are you going to get the Puerto Rican flag or Mister? I said, No. Why? I'm proud. I know who I am. I don't need to flaunt it or mock you or whatever because you're not me or because, you know, I might roll my R's and you don't. Or I said this a certain way. We're brutal with each other, you know? My hair is nice and soft and yours is not. And what the hell? What are we thinking at this point? Sure. And, and we're our own worst enemy. So we can't fix something until we can get over ourselves and fix ourselves first. We can't fix everybody else's problems if we can't fix ourselves. And that goes for everything. And I just feel that I think we've come to a point that people are going to have to make hard decisions. And they're going to say, wait a minute, what am I going to do now? I love my family. But I don't want everybody coming in over and and and, and be and there be lawlessness, right? Sure. And and then you have the other one that goes, damn, but they just got you know abused back where they were. So there's always two sides. Sure. But there has to be somebody that actually has, I don't want to say the word, the you know what to just get it done. Stop the nonsense. Take ownership. No one wants to take ownership. No one wants to take responsibility anymore. It's almost like it's a bad thing to do. Sure. You, you mean uh, the uh, Lo Cojine? Uh, it's a family show. Exactly. Family show. Yes, Lo Cojine. Family show, Lo Cojine, right? Okay. Very good stuff. I like to keep it PG here on the program. My producer, <laughs> might, uh, my, my producer might get on me there for that. No. But, uh, obviously, if I use something else. Uh, Joe, let me ask you this, because I think that it also bears repeating that during this election cycle, certainly immigration, I think, is front and center. Uh, certainly the optics of, you know, there is some lawlessness in cities around this country that because of a wide open border, we're seeing what's going on. Obviously, we're seeing migrants being bused to different parts of the country. Obviously, the the economic burden, it's putting, again, just across the river in New York City, right? We're seeing it in Manhattan. We're seeing it in uh, in Texas and Florida, other parts of California. But I think another issue that I think that really has gone under the radar, and I don't know why, but it's an issue I think that I think is really affecting Hispanics now more than ever, and that's inflation, and that's interest rates. And I think that ever since COVID, hey, listen, we know price gouging took place. Um, a lot of people and companies were never held accountable. Some small businesses were never held accountable. But even then, again, inflation continues to suffocate us, and so much so that you know within our community, I mean, many of us have to sort of be faced with very difficult choices. Do we pay rent? Do we pay car insurance? Do we pay our, our, our monthly car payment? Hey, can we afford to go on vacation that for a lot of years, mira, vamos a Disney World or oh, Miami or vamos a, a California or wherever, right? Or south of the border and, and you know, right on that border of uh, North Carolina, and South Carolina, yeah. you know? But the point is that I think our community now more than ever is really being suffocated with inflation, with these fuel prices that, again, when you stop drilling domestically, and again, listen, here in New Jersey, 
we're not getting any favors by the governor and the legislature with another gas tax that's due to take effect soon. Um, it, it just seems like inflation, the cost of food, the cost of homes, interest rates. I mean, again, people are, I talk to realtors all the time. And one thing I hear is, yes, people are buying homes, but it's not commensurate with right. what happened before COVID. I mean, we're not, people just cannot afford these interest rates and inflation's making it more expensive to go cook our birthday dinners, our, our Christmas dinners. Oh yeah, comprar un pernil, it's a gift to donate an organ. Yep. Like, I think that's not being discussed enough. And when you talk to other PACs, you know, what are you hearing about what's being underreported or under discussed? I think part of, I mean, a lot of it is, is economic. I mean, I feel that right now, the way just in the last year, what you could have bought with a hundred dollars and get six, you know, bags of compra to take home now has dwindled to four for the same amount of money. Right. And it's hurting the people that have to have then two jobs or the kid that can't go to college now because he has to work so he can't do it full time. So it's going to take him twice as long to finish because he's trying to help out with, you know, or she's trying to help out with the money at home, getting a, another job when or to have people that have studied and have their degrees. And now you're like, OK, what am I going to do now? So I think a few things are going to hit. It's going to be education, and I've served on two different boards, one on the Hackensack School Board of Education and one for Bergen Community College. I did that for six years. So, and I was an educator for 34. So I, I, that's in my blood. So I, and I think that's going to be a big topic, especially in, in, in a lot of the states in the South. Um, you know, New York and New Jersey and, and Connecticut kind of is its own bubble. It's sure. its own sphere that covers yeah. over it. But right. when you come down here, like I got here last Tuesday, it's a whole other world. Oh, it was even coming, even coming into the plane. Swear to God, I had people tell me. I said, "Oh, you're you from New York?" Oh, yeah. They go, "Those effing Democrats." And I laugh. I'm thinking to myself, "Okay, I'm not going to get into a discussion on politics." I'll on say that because I'll say it on a plane. I say that on a plane all the time. Bro, they'll throw you right off. So I'm trying yeah. to get on the plane and get my seat. Right. So my thing is. It's different. And that's what people forget. Yeah, we are the United States of America, but depending on where you live, it's different. Your experience is different. Your upbringing is different. Your beliefs are different. Your education is different. I was blessed that being Puerto Rican, my father and my mother and our extended family saw things and we did things as my, my father would tell me, when you fill out a form, do not put Latino or Hispanic you put white. And I never understood why. He goes, because I don't want you to get something that you didn't deserve. And I don't want anybody to judge you differently. Would I have put it that way? No, but that's how he put it. That's how he saw it. Sure. And I and I understand the mindset. Things are changing, right? But what people forget is that when things are changing, you have to educate yourself. You just can't pick a side and say, I'm going to stick with the side, good, bad, or indifferent. No, you got to educate. Like you said it earlier, do your homework. Don't just go on Twitter or YouTube or whatever the hell. And and all of a sudden today, I'm the most liberal person or tomorrow I'm the most conservative because that's what so-and-so said on Instagram. That's crap. You know, they get their five seconds of fame and they keep it moving. No. No, Joe, I'm with you. And, and it's funny because, you know, again, in my capacity as a broadcast journalist and also as an academic, I was invited on a podcast recently and the host was like, well, let's see if Fernando actually can say something nice about the, the other side again it was it was you know obviously a conservative and liberal on the panel and uh i got quite a laugh out of the audience when is that right fernando this is probably going to stump you a little bit but can you actually name one policy that joe biden has helped hispanics and latinos and i said oh absolutely i would argue that the president has helped to cure obesity and he and everyone looked at each other on the panel like what what did you say i said oh yeah they have he's absolutely helped cure obesity because none of us can afford to eat so of course he's he's curing obesity and the whole the whole panel just lost their minds laughing. They're like, wow, at the Fernando de Saco eso. He's like, wow, he got that off. Uh, but in all seriousness, though, when we think about policies during this cycle, you know, one of the things I think that PACs uh again, I think at, at its core is trying to raise awareness. Like to your point about what Somos New Jersey does, is raising awareness not just about trying to run for, for office, but also getting involved and having interactions with legislators. So in your capacity, you, along with the executive board at Somos New Jersey, what's been your experience lately talking to people in Trenton? Because again, you're a New Jersey-based PAC. So when you're talking to the governor, you're trying to talk to legislators, I mean, what's been that experience? Because so, obviously, you know, New Jersey's, I mean, it's we're getting priced out of here. And it's, 
I can honestly tell you because I've worked with many of the the legislatures and and Congress, Senate, even uh, with Governor Murphy himself, um, and we do express what's what we feel is wrong. You know, you have someone, and and this is personal, having nothing to do with my pack. But for me personally, I have someone like let's say Godheimer, um, Congressman Godheimer, who kind of can told the line a little bit better than most when it comes to um, meeting more people in the middle on both sides without getting into, you know, drama like other people like to bring, you know, to, to, to Trenton. So they've been, we've had access to them and we tell them our wants and we tell them our needs. We've taken, um, even when I was on the college, I took students to, to, to meet with them and tell them what they were going through and, and the issues that their families are having. So we do bring that awareness to them. The, the the thing is that even as a Democrat that I am, and like I said, but more moderate, they they don't take two steps forward without taking three back sometimes. And that's my opinion. Totally. And, and it bothers me because there could be so much more done. And so when I do have one, like I said, like a Gottheimer that, that really sees it. And no one is perfect. He has done things that I'm not thrilled with, but he's done things that I'm I'm good with. And, and I'm okay with that. You know what? As long as you put yourself out there and you give it your best shot and you try to, to help as many people without picking a side, because they shouldn't pick a side if you're in this field, sure. then I'm good with that. And that's what we try to put people. So we're trying to get people more involved locally, on school boards, on PTAs, whatever, through the church. And then when there's uh, an issue community-wise, like when even when COVID hit, there were a lot of churches in Hackensack that banded together that we were able to get food ba uh, banks out weekly. And the county of Bergen did a great job getting us even police help to, to make the lines for people. So that's the way that we try to make it. A little bit, here's the thing, Fernando. If you are able to help somebody a little bit, if you make it here, I was always taught you extend your hand and you bring the next person with you. That was what I was always taught by my dad. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give the people to show them, yeah, you don't have to do this this way because it was done forever or accepted. You can do it this way. And this is what you will lo lo que va a lograr at the end. Right. And that's and that's the goal. We're not trying to outshine anybody. We're not trying to outdo anybody. We're just trying to get that equal footing and have a voice so that we have that same seat. And I know it's something that everybody says, the same seat at the table, but the reality is, you said it yourself earlier, look at it, Th there ain't many of us. I might get over because I got the white hair, I look more Italian than I do Puerto Rican. <laughs> but the reality is, you know, it, it's, it's not that, we're not there yet. And it's gonna be a while. Well, Joe, let me ask you this also. I mean, obviously, you know, we've talked about the aims and goals of, of Somos New Jersey. But it kind of begs the question, I mean, you're very engaged, you're very animated about the political process. It sort of begs the question, uh, when is uh, when is this young man going to maybe take a stab at running for some office, whether it's school board, whether it's a legislative seat? Uh, you know, what do we have on the horizon for, for, for Joseph Barreto? Because, you know, for, for someone as engaged as you are, and I've enjoyed this conversation immensely tonight. Thank you. Um, Thank you. you know, a lot of people are going to, I'm sure you've been asked about this. I'm sure I won't be the last person to ask you, but when is, uh, when are we going to see the name Joseph Barreto on a ballot? So my friend is now chiming to me here on the side and you'll laugh. He's like, first Puerto Rican president. <laughs> so okay. my thing is, look, I've always wanted to be, to run. I vote. I, and I made no bones about that. If I would have been in New York, honestly, I would have had a seat somewhere because it's different. It's a different animal over there, the way they run things. Sure, sure. Right? Here, unfortunately, it's the, the, the actual, you know, um, party leaders that make a lot of the decisions. And if you're not 75 years in the system, you know, you're done, you know, unless you're really rich and then you could run on your own without a backing. That's what bothers me. And I know I'm going to get a lot of heat from later on and I'm good with that, sure. but I don't care. The reality is though, I would love to, but if I can't for whatever reason, then I had someone tell me once, do you want to be the king or the king maker? And if I can help other people to become the king with and do it the right way, not in a sneaky 
you know, underhanded, let me get over, you know, let me ride in a real cool ass car and do this. No, I want to do it the right way. So that's, that's my goal. If anybody out there wants, you know, we offer our, our, our services to everybody to help. We don't know everything. We don't play, we don't play like we do. We're willing always to ask if we don't know, we're willing to get the help if we need it. And all I want the people to know out there is that I appreciate you, Fernando, for this today. I really do. I thank you for giving us this, um, you know, forum to do this. I'm hoping that everybody out there that's listening knows, you, and, and the Latinos, you don't have to put up with the nonsense you've put up with forever. You don't have to accept what you've been given. You have a choice. And if you want to, if you need to learn how to make those better choices, call us and we'll help you. Joe, you mentioned a very important term. And when you said it, I said, uh oh, that's my next question right off the bat. The term kingmaker. And certainly in the last few weeks, we have seen that that term uh, has come into discussion, right? Uh, Representative Kim uh, has sued to eliminate the county line, right? 49 yeah. other states in the country were, were not practicing what we do here in New Jersey. And it's basically a, a kingmaker system where county chairs, both Republicans and Democrats alike, were essentially coronating people when it comes to the county line. That obviously is being disputed in federal court. We saw today again, and a shout out to uh, David Wallstein, the editor of the New Jersey Globe. I, I believe that the Republican lines are going to stay intact, but there still hasn't been a decision made on the Democrat lines that, again, Representative Kim looked to sue about. Now, having said that, uh, from people you're talking to in New Jersey, I mean, it must be a breath of fresh air knowing that whether it's this cycle, or the or, or next year's cycle, which again is very very pivotal because we have a gubernatorial race, we have right. all eighty assembly seats up for grabs. We have a lot of municipal races. Case in point, here in Hudson County, where I live, in both in the city of Hoboken and Jersey City, the mayoral race is up for grabs, and all nine council seats are up for grabs. So the premise of a county line looks like it's going to be eradicated, and there'll be the common practice like every other state has, right? Um, when it comes to selecting who, I guess, parties want to back in elections. But more so, I think now more than ever, I think that it is neutralizing county chairs, both Republicans and Democrats alike, where, again, to your point about kingmakers, they were ultimately, hey, this is who we want running in this county, both Republican and or Democrat. And that seems to be, I guess, going out the window, maybe not in the Republican Party in New Jersey, but clearly it looks like that's going to be happening on the Democrat party. So when you heard about this lawsuit and you heard about ultimately the eradication of the line, what came to mind for you? Amen. Because the reality is this, if we're both Democrats or Republicans and why should I be picked over you and you're kicked over to another line when people know for a fact bullet voting exists, people normally just, Go down the line, maybe skip a name or two. But if you have 15 people running, you think they're going to take time to go over side three lines, four lines and find the guy's name there? It's not fair. It's just BS. But it was a way to keeping people in power, again, probably to our detriment, which no one wants to say. But they kept us literally out of stuff because they were able to control that. And that's what bothers me. So the moment I heard that that was the case, I said, Coño, maybe now there'll be a little bit more where the, the local Joe can now have a voice because that voice was taken away from him by somebody who was just sitting back and made decisions based on whatever the criteria was. Well was said. No, criteria. no, well said. Joe, before I let you go here tonight, folks, it's 7.53. We're about to wrap up here with the chairman of Somos New Jersey PAC, Joseph Barreto here, join us here on Real Talk. Joe, um, when we think about PACs and we think about being nonpartisan, nonprofit, um, first thing, another thing that comes to mind as well is fundraising. And as a PAC, even though you're not making endorsements and you're not taking sides, I mean, obviously you'd like to host events, you'd like to create networking opportunities. And the reason I bring this up, for example, is listen, I go to the League of Municipalities. Every year in November in Atlantic City, I love rocking. I saw a nice you there suit. last year. I yeah, exactly. I love rocking a nice suit. I love the yeah. network. I love going to all the parties. I love going to the free open bars, networking, 
there's some nice Latinas around. Listen, I'm going to try to spit some game out there, of course. But uh, more importantly, I look at organizations that are also hosting parties. And the first thing that comes to my mind for me is, wow, I mean, it's caro. being able to fundraise, being able to get either donations from donors, grants. What challenges has Somos New Jersey faced when it comes to fundraising, if any? I don't want to sound – it's funny. So – we're at the Elks Lodge level. <laughs> like, we'll do. That's good. We'll, That's good. We'll do. And the only reason we do this, honestly, is because we have to pay someone for to do our, you know, um, our books to to report, right? Alexandra and I have put out crazy money just to sustain, to keep going, you know. And and we don't get, we don't pull a, a thing and say, oh, I'm going to go to your event free, whether it be a Republican candidate or a Democratic candidate. We pay the entrance to whatever it is. There's no freebies. There's no gimmies. Collecting money is tough yeah, because you also, you know, th you also want to make sure that the agenda you have there. So we always make it just, look, we just need money to, to sustain ourselves, to keep going forward. We're not throwing $10,000 there, $50,000. We're not doing that because we can't. And we wouldn't, that wouldn't be us anyway. Like it's something like it just doesn't sit right. So, you know, it's hard. And when people, honestly, we, we just make enough or we put out of our pockets enough to keep us afloat so that we can make the reportings, you know, to ELAC. Um, if um, actually we give to, to the churches and stuff that help, that allow us to go and help the people, we make donations there too. Because it's only right. You're giving me the time. I'm going to give help you help the people that are coming to your church that need the help. Why not? Well said there. I mean, listen, I don't know about you. I love Elks Lodge parties. So, I mean, when yeah, you, tell me, <laughs> you let me know when there's another Elks Lodge party because I like those. I mean, yeah. listen, the uh, the pours on the drinks, I mean, son, mira, son. No, no, they're, very, they're very generous. <laughs> right? But before I let you go again, Joe, I, I want to thank you for your time. I mean, this has been an extremely illuminating conversation and I'm really happy to be able to give as much visibility and exposure to Somos New Jersey Pack. Obviously, folks, make sure you check them out on Facebook. Thank of course, you. follow them on Instagram. And uh, listen, you're doing great work again. Best of luck to you and the rest of the executive board. They're all hardworking. They're all doing great things to, to raise awareness, to raise visibility, and ultimately, to again, to empower Hispanics, Latinos, and Latinas collectively in such a climate where, again, in less than 10 years, we're going to be the majority. We're going to be the majority of college degree graduates. We could be uh, hopefully close to a majority of CEOs owning small business. Again, a shout out to, you know, Carlos Medina and Luis De La Host from the yeah. State White Bank Chamber of Commerce. I love them. I mean, I see the, the great things that they're doing. Uh, Darwin Roman with the Latino Chamber of Commerce. I mean, Latinos and Hispanics collectively are making that imprint in politics, in the economy, I think in small businesses and also in PACs. And certainly, I think you're leading the way. Uh, you're doing a great job. I I've really enjoyed this conversation. Certainly, look forward to having you back on later this year, sort of as an update during this election cycle. I'll keep. I'll give you the last word here tonight. I just want to thank you, Fernando. Te lo agradezco de todo corazón. I want to thank everyone out there for viewing, for listening. We don't always have to agree, but we have to respect. And if we can respect one another and work together, especially as Latinos, we can do great things. Gracias. Unbelievable. God bless you. Listen, uh, just in advance, happy Father's Day to you coming up. Um, as we get a little bit warmer here, happy Memorial Day. And obviously, you, uh, you know, best of luck to you, the rest of the executive board at Somos New Jersey. Folks, once again, check them out on Facebook. Make sure you like them. And of course, follow them on Instagram. Donate if you can. Get involved with them. Folks, you want to be part of the political process? It starts with Somos New Jersey Pack. Here and their and their chairman, Joe Barreto, join us here on Real Talk via Jersey First to be Joe Mira. Que Dios te bendiga. And by the way, just since you are Puerto Rican, listen, I'm a big pro wrestling fan. Some history was made last weekend with Damian Priest now being only the second WWE World Heavyweight Champion, the first, the great Pedro Morales. Pedro Morales, yeah. In the 70s, <laughs> uh, certainly Damian Priest, proud Boricua there. That's being so the cool. new world heavyweight champion as he won it in Philadelphia at WrestleMania 40. So Boricua is representing him. Listen, we saw Bad Bunny 
over the weekend at Barclays. I mean, my wife was there. I was here, and my wife was at the concert with my sister and my nephews and niece in Barclays. Yes. Ave Maria. Listen, it's El running Conejo wild. Malo. <laughs> it's running wild. But once again, man, my friend here is actually really, my my friend here, Miguel, is Bad Bunny's cousin. So I'm laughing. He's like a conejo, el primo del conejo malo, right? <laughs> Mira, dígale saludo a Benito, okay? But uh, I will. Que le diga saludo a Benito. <laughs> saludo a Benito, okay? Tell him to come on the show, please. Tell him to come on the show. But Gracias, uh, folks, Papa. again. Gracias please, have, please have him come on the show. It'd be great to have a conversation with him. But uh, but folks, again, he is Joseph Barreto, the chairman of Somos New Jersey PAC, our guest tonight here on Real Talk. Joe, God bless you. Y hablamos pronto. Que okay, yo te me cuide. Gracias por todo. Igual. Bye-bye. Folks, great, great episode here tonight with, once again, Joe Barreto, um, the chairman of the Somos New Jersey PAC. Again, shout out to them and Obviously, the great executive board working hard to raise visibility for candidates and to get more Hispanics and Latinos and Latinas collectively to get involved in the political process. And that's a good thing, folks, now more than ever. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, it's 8 o'clock on the East Coast. Exactly the clock has struck 8 here on the East Coast. And folks, before we call it a night, you know what time it is. It's time for final thoughts. And folks, I cannot say enough about, uh, quite frankly, again, being your champion of excellent journalism here in New Jersey, I always feel it's important to to illustrate who's doing you a disservice every single day. When I think about bad journalism, I think about checking my emails. And when I do, every so often, at least once a week, I'm always getting emails from NJ.com, right? Oh, support responsible journalism. I'm like, ¿de cuándo? NJ.com isn't responsible. They're not reputable. But then somehow NJ.com, along with the Star Ledger, would have you believe that they are. And even asking for as little as a dollar for the very first month to get on their paywall. And of course, you know, after the 30 days, you know, free trial, they'll charge you, I think, over $20. Folks, let's be honest. If you know anything about this show, or if you know anything about reputable journalism. Again, what comes to mind is a fellow colleague, again, the best journalist there is, David Wildstein. Well, he would agree with me because when it comes to bad journalism in New Jersey, it starts with NJ.com and the Star Ledger. And when we talk about atrocious journalism, ladies and gentlemen, now more than ever, we're always remembering. Folks, it's Tom Moran. And by the way, I just want to Applaud Tom Moran. I haven't talked about Tom Moran in quite some time, but I know that on December 22nd last year, a few months ago, he celebrated a birthday. So once again, happy 85th birthday to Tom Moran. It's it's so empowering to see a guy as old as, as Tom Moran, 85 years old, trabajando y ahí en la lucha. Mira, hombre, 85 años. Mira, que Dios te bendiga. Because I'll tell you, folks, a lot of people are 85 aren't as active and aren't as, you know, up there and being out and about. Now, again, in terms of being cognitively declining, yes, we can rely on Tom Moran to remind us all about the dangers of cognitive decline. And now more than ever, we think about what Tom Moran is advocating for. And over the weekend, it was brought to my attention because I don't follow Tom Moran on Twitter. And I know Tom Moran has had some things to say about me, and that's okay because all it does is help my traffic. So, Tommy, muchas gracias. Because, again, hating on me doesn't really hurt me. It actually helps me. But one of the things that, again, reminds us about how irresponsible Tom Moran is, is going on Twitter, right, and talking about Governor Phil Murphy or talking about NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, right? I'm going to read you again, and I just use a screenshot there just for you, okay? But over the weekend, Tom Moran decided to answer Julie Rajinsky, another, let's be very fair, folks, another insufferable woman in New Jersey politics who now has buyer's remorse all of a sudden about Governor Phil Murphy and his wife, Tammy. When you knew fully well, Julie, in, in 2016, when you decided to go help Phil Murphy get elected, well, guess what? Gas tax, taxation, the highest property taxes in the country. So, yeah, you live in New York City, so it doesn't really affect you. But, folks, the next time you want to look to blame somebody for why New Jersey has become a dump, folks, look look at Julie Rajinsky. All sanctimonious Julie Rajinsky, 
who loves to lecture us about, oh, how evil the Murphys are, you contribute to that, Julie. You're responsible for the gas tax. You're responsible for having the highest property tax in the country. You're responsible for coddling illegals. You're responsible for the budget getting fatter than the latest Victoria's Secret models. But now Julie Rajinsky wants to wipe her hands of this. Doesn't work that way, Amor. Take some responsibility. I know it's hard for you, but take some responsibility. So, of course, Julie Rajinsky writes, wow, imagine if this woman could have spoken out and called to testify at trial to underscore OJ's tendency to physically abuse women. Of course, folks, we know, thankfully, OJ Simpson passed away last week due to his complications with cancer. A guy who, let's be honest, murdered two people, right? And really, that trial of the century became a spectacle and almost a clown show of the legal system. But again, precisely why we at, at Lift Our Voices US are fighting so hard to eradicate workplace NDAs like this one at Gretchen Carlson. So, of course, Tommy, you know, who loves to be sanctimonious también, because that's all Tommy lives for, decides to write horrifying. And you are so right, Julie. These NDAs are sickening and still feel sorry you had to sign one to work for at Governor Murphy. Not to mention that he and his team lied about it over and over again, including to me. When? Let's, let, let, let's, I'm going to shoot a little bit here because I think it's important to expose Tom Moran for the fraud that he is. Tom Moran is a guy that not just once, but twice decided to endorse Phil Murphy for governor. In 2017, he was running against then Lieutenant Governor Kim Godano, an awful candidate, not really her fault. All right. She was working at the time again as a lieutenant governor under the auspices of then Governor Chris Christie, arguably one of the worst governors in New Jersey history, who left New Jersey with a horrendous approval rate. But of course, during 2016, Julie Brzezinski and others made sure to jump on the Phil Murphy bandwagon as he poured millions of his own dollars into that campaign. And again, I'm not really mad at Phil Murphy because he told you what he was going to do. He told you he was going to raise taxes. He told you he was going to prioritize pronouns over property taxes. He told you he was going to prioritize illegals and make New Jersey a sanctuary state and coddle illegals and, and really neutralize ICE here in this state by making New Jersey a sanctuary state. Okay? By getting legislators to, to jump on board with raising taxes, with creating more government bureaucracy, right? Bill Murphy didn't lie to you. He told you exactly what he was going to do, and you all fell for it, whether it's courtesy of Julie Rajinsky and other operatives who went along for the ride. And again, Tom Moran, Sim Pena, decides to endorse Phil Murphy in 2017. But let's fast forward to 2021, when we knew, and we've all learned, folks, that Governor Murphy killed people in nursing homes and veterans' homes. He destroyed the state's business climate. He destroyed small businesses. He kept schools shut down, of course, with the NGEA, because the NGEA, a otra basura of a, of, a, of a public sector union, along with CWA, another public sector union, que basura, and decided to keep the state closed longer than it should have. And Jack Chiarelli, again, I like Jack personally, but as uninspiring as that campaign was, still came within three points of unseating Governor Phil Murphy. But you had no problem endorsing Phil Murphy, Tom. You've had no problem enabling Phil Murphy policies. Again, cutting the illegals, prioritizing pronouns over property taxes, suffocating us with taxation, making sure that, hey, you enable the legislators in Trenton to raise the gas tax once again, to create, again, a bigger government bureaucracy, to make the budget fatter. Again, folks, I can go on. A, I don't have enough fingers and toes to name the amount of things that Phil Murphy has done to destroy New Jersey. But you know who was right there? You know who was right there clapping him on? Because again, hey, Phil Murphy seemed to be the lesser of two evils. No, Tom, have some into I know Tom, you know, Tom Moran struggles with a lot of words. But the biggest word he struggles with is four little one, integrity. Tom doesn't have any. Okay? He doesn't know what integrity is, much less spell it. More on that later. But folks, again, what's interesting about Tom Moran is to be sanctimonious and to be on this high horse and to have this selective moral outrage when, again, people like you, Tom, and Julie Rajinsky contribute to the decline of New Jersey. Why? Because you've enabled Phil Murphy. 
And now all of a sudden, you want to seem like, oh, I'm the guy that was the voice of reason. Tom, you're never the voice of reason. We've learned that. Okay. But what was more egregious over the weekend, right, is not just this nonsense about coddling Julie Rajinsky, okay, but going after Tom Moran. I'm going to read you this tweet. So, of course, Tom Moran goes, what's worse, the nutjobs who believe in Trump, question mark, or those like Representative Tom Kane who knows it's nonsense but go along to save their jobs? Hashtag, hashtag Ukraine, hashtag betrayal. Go Sue Altman, we deserve better. Mira, there's a lot of things we deserve. Sue Altman isn't one of them. And again, if we look at the track record, Tom Moran is the last person we should ever rely on when it comes to political endorsements and who are actually good candidates. Okay? Again, I get it, Tom. You're 85 years old. Again, happy belated birthday, you know. Feliz cumpleaños. I get it. Okay? But What's, what, what's, what's starting to concern me about Tom Moran at, at the age of 85 is how tone deaf he is when it comes to candidates. I have my issues with, with Tom Kane, certainly. But if he's doing sort of a 180 on, on Ukraine and so is Speaker Mike Johnson, why not? Folks, today's tax day, right? So if you haven't filed your taxes yet under dependents, make sure you write in President Zelensky because he's clearly one of our dependents. Right? When it comes to the billions of tax dollars we're sending to Ukraine. Why? It's that war's been going on for two years and there's no end in sight. But we keep funneling money to Ukraine. It's not our problem. Let Putin do whatever he wants with Ukraine. We should be worried about Americans. Right? We should be worried about Americans. But don't tell the Tom Moran, because Tom Moran would rather virtue signal than actually get something right. But what's even funnier about Tom Moran is the audacity to say to you, hey, go Sue Altman. We deserve better. You mean this Sue Altman? Take that seat. Take that seat over in the middle. And of course, folks, look right there. I'll show it to you again, just in case you, you know, missed it. Mira esa cara de estupido. Right there. Look who it is. What a surprise. Tom Moran. A guy who, very, folks, it's clear, had no problem laughing at Sue Altman, acting like an ass inside the state house. But this is who Tom Moran thinks should represent the 7th Congressional District, a left-wing radical like Sue Altman who wanted to fund the police. Again, folks, the tweets are there. The receipts are there. Who's the executive director of the Working Families Alliance for New Jersey. Folks, a progressive think tank that doesn't have one progressive policy that would even help New Jersey. But this is, again, mira esa cara estupido, right there. Mira esa cara estupido. That's who Tom Moran wants you to believe is a good candidate for the House of Representatives. To say nothing of the fact that not just with Tom Moran, but the other list of insufferable women in New Jersey politics that enable Sue Altman, right? All the other women, Jay Lasseter, Maria Rodriguez Gregg, Hetty Rosenstein, if she's awake, I mean, it's like 8.15. Yes, I ya está durmiendo hace hora. Angeline Mahotra, right? All the others out there on Sue Altman's little Twitter page. Yes, these are the people endorsing Sue Altman, a woman who can't even conduct yourself properly in public. Folks, I get it. We've all watched this video. Okay. We've all watched her make an ass of herself in Trenton. 
And I get it that she was removed. Again, folks, what people forget is the context that if you can't act like an adult, you're going to be removed. And when you're making an ass of yourself and you're being rambunctious and you're being disorderly and you're being noisy and you're being just creating a disturbance, folks, that's why the state police, folks, the state police just don't just remove you because they feel like it. They're going to remove you when you're being a nuisance. That's what Sue Altman is. And of course, enabled by who? Ahí la cara estupido, Tom Moran. So the next time you read Tom Moran, folks, the next time you read Tom Moran and he's going to tell you about who's a good candidate, folks, you should know better. Okay. And when it comes to reading political endorsements, when it comes to reading what's reputable journalism, folks, my good friend and fellow journalist David Wastin, the editor of the New Jersey Globe, would tell you the same thing. NJ.com, the Star Ledger, it's not worth even one dollar. And when we think about, again, bad journalism, folks, don't take my word for it. There's a reason why the Star Ledger is losing circulation. There's a reason why people think that we're getting trash journalism and somehow we're supposed to pay for it. Somehow we're supposed to pay for really atrocious journalism. Folks, this isn't a prediction. It's a spoiler. The next time someone asks you about what bad journalism is, you don't have to look very far. Folks, all you got to look at is the Star Ledger. And really, where does it belong? Yeah, it belongs here. When I think about bad journalism, I think of Tom Moran. And when I think about where Tom Moran belongs, yeah, folks, Tom Moran, that belongs in the trash, too. And those are my final thoughts. Folks, before we call it a night here, I do want to send as a reminder, coming up on Friday night, April the 26th, at the world-famous Lolita's, located on River Road in North Bergen at 8809 River Road, I'll bring you the 2024 edition of Memories Matter to benefit the Alzheimer's New Jersey organization. Joining me that evening will be my incredible co-hosts, Vladimir Carrero, Emily Amato, Yanoli Guerrero, and Jacqueline Rodriguez. We'll be greeting you at the door. We are asking for a $20 suggested donation. Of course, we'll have raffles, a 50-50, an excellent menu of food and obviously beverages there available, folks. It is a cash bar. Don't forget, of course, to bring cash for the raffles and 50-50. We'll have just outstanding music by DJ Ziggy Roman. And of course, folks, all proceeds from the evening benefit Alzheimer's New Jersey. And together, we can defeat Alzheimer's once and for all. Folks, before we call it a night, a special, some breaking news here this evening, right? We call it a career for the great John Sterling. And John Sterling, again, just to give you a perspective, today the New York Yankees announced that the legendary play-by-play man on the radio who has called 5,420 regular season games and 211 postseason games is retiring effective immediately. He'll be recognized in a pregame ceremony this Saturday, April the 20th, and will visit the WFAN booth during the game. Folks, I got to tell you, John Sterling was part of my childhood, part of my adolescence, and part of my adult life. Growing up, this is what you wore. This is what you were proud to wear, the hat of the New York Yankees. I've worn it since I was five years old and still proudly do to this day. And when I think of John Sterling, I think of Saturday night, October the 26th, 1996. I was out with some friends out in New York City, out in Midtown, watching game six as the Yankees had made a historic comeback down two games to nothing against the the defending champion Atlanta Braves. And I remember just before midnight when Mark Lemke at the plate, and I remember the call like it was yesterday. I remember hearing Lemke pops it up again, off third. Hayes has room. Hayes makes the catch. The Yankees win. The Yankees win. Ladies and gentlemen, I remember. because Up to that point, again, I'm not dating myself here, but I had never seen the Yankees win a World Series. That was my first World Series championship to celebrate as a Yankee fan. It's also my favorite one. But the iconic call by John Sterling reminded us all. And I got to tell you, folks, I got I got Misty. 
I choked up. There were tears of joy, not just in my eyes, but in so many people around me. And I remember going to Times Square with a group of friends that we still talk about it to this day. Times Square looked like New Year's Eve with the Yankees winning the World Series. I remember John Sterling's historic call, one of so many that we were blessed to have. The John Sterling, I love you. You've been a, just an incredible part of my development, of my fandom, and most importantly, my love for the New York Yankees. A hat, again, that I wear proudly. A hat that I will rock until the day I die. When I think of John Sterling, I think of the impact he left on all of us. Congratulations, John, on a wonderful career. Thank you for the memories. Thank you for the inspiration. And thank you for just being John Sterling. Let's go, Yankees. And John, congratulations on your retirement. And that's our show for this week. Once again, I want to thank Somos New Jersey PAC Chairman Joseph Barreto for an exceptional conversation. Folks, sharing is caring. Click that share button and make sure you let everybody know how much you enjoy Real Talk. Of course, make sure you like us on Facebook. Of course, also follow us on Instagram and Twitter. I'll always call it Twitter. I won't call it X. And certainly for all you YouTube subscribers, please make sure to click the subscribe button. And of course, you'll be notified of all the great content brought to you by Jersey First TV. Of course, whether you get your podcast on Spotify or SoundCloud, download Jersey First and take it with you anywhere at any time. I cannot say enough, really, folks, about the metrics, the traffic. Without all of you, ladies and gentlemen, watch the show live and share the replays, we would not be as successful as we are with Jersey First TV. And again, I can't say enough how proud I am to be on the dream team of New Jersey TV. That's right, folks. It's Jersey First TV, of course. Make sure you check it out at www.jerseyfirst.org slash TV. Brand new episodes of the Nader Narrative premiere every Thursday, hosted by the amazing Elizabeth Nader. And of course, brand new episodes of Bridging the Gap with AJ Melillo and Stephen Rombolo premiere every Thursday. And of course, check your local listings for time on Monday nights for the latest editions of Real Talk with Fernando Uribe. Folks, I cannot say enough once again how proud I am to work with these outstanding men and women at Jersey First TV. And always remember, if it's unbiased, unfiltered, and unafraid, it's always Real Talk right here with Jersey First TV. I am New Jersey's premier award-winning journalist, top 50 Latino as voted on by the Latino Spirit Online Magazine for the last three consecutive years, and of course, along with the United States Latino Affairs Initiative. And now more than ever, ladies and gentlemen, I'll continue to be the weapon of mass disruption in Garden State Media, because my level of honesty is truly necessary in this era of journalistic deception. That's right, folks. And of course, I'm always going to be everyone's favorite conservative, Fernando Uribe, saying so long, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of your week, of course. Please party responsibly. Enjoy the NBA playoffs. Of course, let's go Lakers. Let's try to get that chip, as they say. Enjoy the Yankees. Enjoy baseball. Enjoy the warm weather, ladies and gentlemen. Be safe out there. As always, please party responsibly. And we'll see you next Monday night live here as U.S. Representative Ron Menendez from the 8th Congressional District joins us live on Real Talk. Once again, folks, enjoy the rest of your week. Again, take care of yourselves, and thanks for stopping by.